Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with my old friend, really old, old friend of mine, Richard Fox, who is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at UNM and at, at uh, CNM, um, has been analyzing politics in New Mexico really since uh, just about 1980, when he started writing uh, some columns for us at Century Magazine long ago. Uh, Richard, uh, as it turns out, was the first uh, person that we interviewed on Insight New Mexico uh, some ten and a half months ago, and now he's the 40th person uh, uh, that, that we've interviewed. Um, so I'm really, really happy to have him here. He's going to talk about uh, uh, this year's legislative session and try to do some, well, I know he'll do some excellent analysis of what's happening, and uh, we'll... Uh, we'll start to deal with uh, some of the structural and process issues that the legislature has to deal with. So, Richard, it's great to have you with us. Great to be back at the Mercury, and Happy New Year. So we see this week uh, the legislature heating up uh, with uh, Linda Lopez digging into the Albuquerque Down situation. Um, we read uh, Wally Gordon's excellent column in the Mercury about uh, legislators trying to work around the governor um, by trying to pass numerous constitutional amendments over such things as wanting to use a bit more uh, state permanent fund money to pay uh, for early childhood education, marriage uh, marriage equality amendments, uh, ethics panels amendments, minimum wage. Uh, there's a lot going on. So I'm wondering if you have any kind of general sort of, sort of uh, beginning observations you want to make, and then we'll sort of dive into the, into the heavy analysis. Thank you, Barrett. Um, Yes, I think this this session uh, is is dominated by this presence in the living room of Governor Governor Martinez, um, and she she derives uh, I think some strength at this point vis a vis the legislature because of her one her her fifty five percent thereabouts public approval rating. The legislature uh, checks in with about a 30 percent public approval rating. Also, um, Susanna is is um, at the moment not not particularly uh, burdened by a hard Democratic Party challenge mm -hmm. uh, for her reelection. Um, and finally, Susanna is trading, I think, very effectively on this perception that she has a national future in the Republican Party. Yeah. Um, she, her pet political ambition is, is, is very strong. And I think she's certainly reading from the Republican playbook and uh, right down to campaigning for, for Chris Christie, pre, pre Bridgegate, <laughs> pre George Washington Bridge. Um, and she's, Doing a doing a very very aggressive job of fundraising, not only for her own campaign but for other Republican candidates. She feels uh, that she has a national future, perhaps on a Republican, on a Republican ticket. So so these things um, these things fuel her presence, if you will, vis a vis the legislature, and, and gives her frankly uh, some leverage mm -hmm. that perhaps other governors um, didn't have. Let's put it that way. Wow. Um, at least at at least at this point. So why don't we maybe we could get into this thing by by me making a a, a few observations about right. the culture, the milieu, the the environment up there, and the the legislature itself in in general. Um, what you have uh, you have an amateur, part time legislature. Uh, convening this year in a 30-day session with an election, with a midterm election coming in the fall. Um, and they meet always in the, in the middle of winter when farmers and ranchers don't have a lot to do. And it's always been this way. I mean, this is, this is the time, the calendar, when, um, when, when legislators gather. Um, the legislature has, for the last 35 years, it seems to me, uh, the legislature has... Uh, been running on stronger administrative rules, internal rules, 
and more business management, uh, considerable much more business management and business practices, and better public relations. Now, I don't know whether this has been uh, entirely beneficial for the image of the legislature, but I, I think for about the past 35 years, this is what's been happening. The other things that have been happening is there's a growing decentralization uh, inside, I think, inside the legislature, uh, where power is certainly is still very much in the leadership, uh, both Democrats and Republicans. And there, there's also been a kind of a much more, uh, much greater division of authority inside as to how the legislature is, is run. Now, this is, it may seem imperceptible to the, to the, the distant observer. But I think it's I think it's taking place, and and uh, constituents are really only vaguely still, despite all the efforts to get more public access, more transparency, uh, with things like opening up conference committees and the rest. And there, you can watch the legislature online now at this point, but um, constituents are still only vaguely aware of of um, uh, what's going on. In, in the legislature, um, they need help with state agencies, constituents. Uh, but as far as the legislative process goes, it's still um, fairly opaque to the to the uh, rank and file New Mexican. Still, so you have this you have the leadership in the legislature attempting to harmonize harmonize um, the interests of individual legislature, legislators, interest groups, um, with their own policies and programs. And this has always been a leadership function, but I think, I think it ought to be stated that this is, this is in fact what's going on. So what you have is you have what I would call shopping mall government. You have uh, the legislature as, as shopping mall. You have constituents, and various interest groups, um, individuals who are essentially making customer demands on the uh, on the body, and of course, the presence of lobbies, lobbyists is powerful, is is extremely uh, extremely influential in 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 Santa Fe. So you have this focus on individual interests, and inside the government, these interagency factions, uh, rather than, rather than uh, a more comprehensive understanding of government, the services it provides, and what is essentially in the public interest, in the interest of the, of the whole state. Um, that's, what, that's what state government and the legislature should be doing. But in a in a legislative session, um, this is very very difficult. Now, there's a larger larger factor too. Um, I think really since the middle or late 1970s, uh, New Mexico, like like many states, finds itself caught uh, between the reduction of federal funds, a sort of a steady reduction of federal funds, and a conservative, conservative tide, really, of tax cuts and this whole idea of limited or less government. Uh, I even, I, I recall when I was working up there, I, I recall uh, uh, several legislators who would talk about the fact that the idea of democracy, and I think this is completely wrong, the idea of democracy is for less government, for more freedom, and I think this is a this is a, a very twisted idea, but the idea of limited government is very powerful. Less government, tax cuts, even in, in when we we live in an age of incrementalism and austerity, uh, we live in an age of incremental incremental change. Uh, so this bind, less federal funds. Conservative tide of tax cuts and limited government uh, puts a state like New Mexico in, in a bind. And an example of that, of course, is the is the current funding gap. Where are they going to find the money to fill the gap? Say, for example, in Medicaid, right. 
where there is a, a, a gap between federal funds and the state's share of reimbursement. Also, I, I noticed that, um, I, I think I read in the paper this morning that uh, Bernalillo County government and city, city and, and county governments face a particular bind. I read where Bernalillo County this morning is facing um, the inability to pay its bills by, by next August. Right. They have to borrow money, it looks like. Yeah because of the problems with investment. And I won't go too deeply into that, but, but that's an ex those are two examples, Medicaid funding and, and um, Bernalillo County facing a severe financial crisis. So prior to the mid-70s, uh, how, how, how was the state legislature run? And is it a model that we should perhaps uh, look to again? Uh, is, is it, or the business management practices that that you, that you brought up earlier on in in your observations are they um, choking the legislature's power? Despite all these administrative rules and a, a, a sort of a movement towards business practices in terms of running the legislature, despite all of that, what you have in the legislature, and I, I, to answer your question, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's had the impact that that you might think in hearing me say that about the business practices. Okay. Here's why: a legislative session is a long-running negotiation. Right. Uh, it's a thirty or sixty-day negotiation. It's based on uh, personal and political relationships. Right. These men and women who serve as legislators are all, in varying degrees, friends. Right. Personal relationships are, are, are key uh, up there. And what you have, of course, is a zero-sum environment, once again. Um, you have winners and losers. Right. And you have a battle, an, an extraordinary battle is going on, uh, uh, quietly it may seem right now, but for scarce resources. Right. Um, everything up there, everything that's transacted, it's a very transactional politics. Everything that goes on up there comes with a, with a price. Everything is decided by votes and the influence on those votes. This is, this hasn't changed. Okay. Um, despite I th what I think is what I observe is more, maybe an attempt, uh, at, at more administrative rules and business practices. It's an insider's game, Barrett. It's very much a partisan insider's game. And, and um, what legislators want to do most of all, the thing they want to do most, and most often, is they want to say yes. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what all legislators want to do. They want to say yes to whomever or whatever. And... I always thought that, that um, it's not too hard to be an effective legislator in the first 27 days of a, of a legislative session. It's much more difficult to be an effective legislator in the last three days. It's the sprint to the end. It's the sprint to the end amidst enormous pressures. It's, it's to, you know, the, the usual phrase is crunch time. But amidst all of this, amidst the politics, which is which is heavy duty. You have legislators behaving very, politically very rationally. And by that I mean to be rational as a legislator, you have to have the ability to maximize self-interest. You have to be able to do that. That's what <laughs> rationality means. And you have to be able to perpetuate your political life. In other words, you have to you have to be able to perpetuate your political influence and power, whatever power or influence you have. And that means that means you have to concentrate on the on the overriding goal, which is reelection. And those kinds of behavioral, political behavioral matters is what uh, is constantly, constantly in play. Now, th this also comes with going way back to to to. 50 years or more, uh, the, the continuing rural-urban split, yes. which has always been there, yeah. um, and it's still there. 
despite as we started this this uh, part of our conversation with more administrative rules and an attempt at business practices and public relations. Um, the rational political strategy uh, for any politician, Congress, legislature, General Assembly, whatever it is, the rational strategy is to be able to reward and placate your constituents and your supporters. And to counter that, obviously, you have to be able to block or deny the opposition. This is, this is, this is rational, political, legislative strategy. Okay. And it's what's going on. So on the one hand, we have uh, what really has to be considered um, ancient, <coughs> ancient realities that have probably permeated every, every assembly since, uh, since Athens. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, a particular situation in every state. Uh, and in New Mexico, uh, we notice that it's extremely hard for the legislature to assert itself when it comes to, to, in, to investigating executive behavior and policymaking and, and actual actions. And I know you've been very interested in this odd phenomenon and the role that it plays and the chaos that it can cause in New Mexico. Would you talk a little bit about this, particularly now uh, that we have a gorilla up there in the roundhouse, is I think the term you used at some point. Later on in this conversation, I, um, time permitting, I want to call for a full-time professional legislature with paid professional staff. And, but for now, I think that if you look at CYFD and the problems they're having, I'll just take, I'll take two examples. And you look at the, the downs at Albuquerque and the, the least controversy. Those are two examples of the legislature's inability, despite numerous interim committee meetings, and the travel and the, and, the, and the looks that legislators take in the interim between sessions. One of the great failings of, of this legislative model, the New Mexico legislative model, is the, the inability to do uh, effective oversight. And CYFD and all the problems they're having, includes, you know, we've now got deaths of children. And and um, and and the and the the Racino lease uh, are due to a lack of oversight, and I think that that part of this part of this factor this issue um, is the powerful position of special interest groups, um, which consume more and more time. Uh, between sessions, during sessions, mm. the time of the legislators. Mm. Um, also, when you're part-time, when you receive no salary, when you see, receive per diem and travel expenses, um, and you don't know a lot about ophthalmology, and you don't know a lot about maybe cattle ranching, or you don't know a lot about the technical aspects of important environmental issues, or financial issues for that matter, um, you have to rely on what lobbyists are able to provide. And I don't mean this necessarily in a, in a corrupt sense, because there are really, I think, two or three different kinds of lobbyists. One is the citizen lobbyist, the idealist, yeah. common cause. The other is the technical information lobbyist, who's able to educate you on ophthalmology <laughs> and, and, and oil leases, perhaps, and the environment. And then there's, of course, the political lobbyist, who is the realist, um, the, the, the technical lobbyist being the pragmatist. And, and um, um, the political lobbyist, is, these, are the, these are the bill passers. Yeah. These, who, these who, who people who know how to pass bills with legislators, um, regardless of the, of the title of the bill or the subject matter. But all of this 
shall we say, detracts from a legislator's ability to do oversight, to find out whether legislative intent, for example, on the bills that are passed and implemented, laws that are passed and implemented, are actually being I implemented uh, not only to the intent of the legislature, but they're being implemented as they're supposed to be. And I, I think the, the biggest example right now is, is again, is the tragedy of, of children, youth, and family, that department. This is, this is, I mean, the, the word is, is overused, but it's so frequently necessary to use the word tragedy. Yeah. Uh, the death of children. And, and um, that problem is, is becoming pretty clear. The lack of experienced CYFD staff. I, I don't think it's, it's a, a, a rewriting of the procedures of CYFD that needs to be done. The governor has suggested that we ought to look at at CYFD procedures and policies and perhaps how the department is run, and, and perhaps we should, but um, the issue here is pretty clear. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an impossible caseload. It's a lack of experience in caseworkers. And this is a matter of, of legislative, uh, this is a legislative matter, it seems to me. So at the beginning here, uh, you were talking about the curious plight of legislation legislators who are part-timers, basically, who also do not have staffs. Uh, so you have a, um, at least in terms of administration, a very powerful executive with staffs, with everybody working like crazy to, uh, to promote their policies, her policy in this particular case. And on the other side, you have literally a bunch of harassed people driving around um, per diem with no with no hope to do anything really. I mean they're you know I mean they're com they have to run their own businesses they have to run their own life. What would what would the scenario be if let's say we had a full time paid legislature and a full time paid legislative staff? How would what would the machinery be of legislative oversight? Would there be hearings all the time? Would there be uh, administrative investigations? Would there be a legislative version of DFA? How would it work? Right now, um, very, very often, typically, um, those professional staffers for the legislature, when I use professional, are often drawn from, temporarily, are drawn from state agencies. Right. In other words, uh, analysts with uh, the highway department or the DFA or somewhere like that often go and work as staffers during the session. Um, a very interesting point. Which is, which is a very interesting point because oftentimes those very analysts who become temporarily legislative staffers go on to become very powerful lobbyists, including, uh, including uh, several of my former colleagues when I was working at, at, uh, at DFA. Um, back in the in the eighties, um, how would it work? Well, it would be a it would it would be a microcosm, if you will, of the Congress. Right. Okay. And you would have professionals who knew, uh, and have probably a study public policy uh, people who would know how uh, a law is to be implemented. You would indeed have hearings. You would also have coordination between the professional staffs of legislators during the interim and um, various agencies from law enforcement to uh, various public interest groups. And you would have all of the liaison, all of the liaison, the connections um, that the Congress has. Now, the Congress doesn't do this job very well either. Um, but it's it's certainly they make a an, an oversight of course let's not be let's not be uh, at our first rodeo here i mean oftentimes oversight is abused uh, witness Daryl Issa. right but but um it would be it would be you would be able to mirror on a micro level here um what the congress is able to do albeit not able to do it very well you would have that right and all of this coordination, you have a much broader net to cast, 
with professionals, and you would also be able to um, develop expertise in a staff, whether it be environment, energy, finance, um, and they would be able to supplement legislative, the legislator's knowledge uh, that now has to be developed with seniority and longevity over many years to get to know what's happening in the bowels of the highway department, right. for example. Right. So, that, I mean that that in in bare in bare bones would be would be how it would how it would work, but it must be done. Yeah. Um, I mean I'm I have the luxury of not running for public office or obviously being a legislator, so I can talk about things like full time legislators, longer sessions, in this old shibboleth of well when the legislature's in session, grab your wallet. That sort of thing is, uh, which has now become silly, rather, rather <laughs> silly. Um, in in and the legislature's in session. We have to be vigilant with regard to our freedom. Uh, all of this this silliness, really, that's 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 cliched in the public discourse. Um, so that's that's basically what we need, and, and bare bones how it would work. So, Richard, we know at the moment that uh, New Mexico is in the middle of a terrible drought. We know at the moment that, uh, that, that the governor of California has declared a drought emergency in his state because there's no snowpack in the Sierra Nevada. We know that if it wasn't for a freak rainstorm, uh, the Pecos would, uh, would have been uh, virtually dry and uh, that uh, the city of Carlsbad would probably have made a priority call on Roswell and Artesia to stop drilling water. We know that water is a major, major issue in New Mexico, and I have heard little or nothing from anybody uh, that I that, or at least it's been covered uh, the way the way things are getting covered these days in Albuquerque by the major daily, not by the Mercury, uh, which I think does a good job. Uh, of course, I would say that. But um, what what is happening with water in the legislature? Well. Barrett, water, water, of course, is, is we are in dire straits. We are in dire straits because of the, it looks like a very, uh, a very strong position that Texas is in. Yes. Uh, with regard to their ability to, um, to take, if that's the right word, uh, water that they think they're, they're owed from New Mexico. Um, Water is, as you well know, be certainly better than I, water is both arcane and water, water issues are very arcane, but they're also intensely political. Um, so as far as the legislature goes, I think that, that what we are all waiting for uh, from the governor is her, her, her priority list of water projects. And uh, it, it may be, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think anybody's seen the prioritization of these projects. No. Yeah. Um, I do think the figure of one and a half million dollars has been tossed about um, a drop, if you will, a drop in the bucket. Truly a drop in the bucket. Um, and we're also talking about serious needs for water infrastructure in water infrastructure projects. Um, but we're waiting essentially for the governor who, um, by all accounts, is not going to propose the resources to deal with this dire problem. I think water is something that's now beginning to, well, long since, but it's now beginning to hit the consumer in terms of, I read where we've done very well in Albuquerque with conservation. But I also read today, I believe, that water bills will be going up in July yeah. because of water infrastructure, the infrastructure of, of decaying water lines and, and an old city, so to speak, that, that we need. And again, it's, it's scarce resources to uh, certainly not fix, but, but certainly reduce the, the dire straits that we're in with regard to water. It, it's... Um, it may be our number one issue, uh, and it's certainly not a sleeper issue anymore, it seems to me. So uh, we know that, uh, that the issue of legalized marijuana is 
has been slowly moving down from Colorado into New Mexico. And I'm wondering what your views are on that. Well, my personal view, of course, is on the merits of the issue is, is that I would, I would support I would support Jerry Ortiz y Pino's amendment to the Constitution, although I'm not sure this issue should be in the Constitution. Um, from, a, from a political scientist point of view, I'm not sure it's a constitutional issue. But on the merits, I, I would support it. What, what uh, Jerry Ortiz y Pino wants to do, of course, is to legalize the sale, possession, and consumption of marijuana. Um, under certain conditions and with certain provisos, a la Colorado, right. for revenue purposes, um, how all of this would be would be regulated uh, is is also complex. Um, I think that that the problem, of course, is there are two problems. One is it's a thirty day session, and I, I don't I think time will run out on on uh, um, Jerry Ortiz y Pino's constitutional amendment proposal. But he needs, um, and here's the other problem, uh, he needs 22 senators and 36 representatives in the House to um, get it to the ballot. Um, constitutional amendments are intentionally, back to the founders, back to the framers, intentionally difficult. Um, so you need super majorities. To get them on the ballot, the other the other problem that we have in general in New Mexico, about all constitutional amendments or, shall we say, ballot issues, is we have no, a uh, rather undemocratic uh, situation in New Mexico. We have no uh, initiative procedure. Right. We have no way to generate ballot initiatives from the body politic or the voter. So, but I think I think um, Jerry's real problem here is is will be a lack of time in a in a thirty day session. Now, in a sixty day session, you know, all bets all bets may be off. So we know the session too. We have uh, long, long, long awaited uh, confirmations or votes of no confidence for certain cabinet secretaries, particularly Sidney Squire and Hannah Scandera. Could you uh, uh, give us a view of what you think is going on with this? I think with regard to confirmations, let's let's look at uh, let's look at uh, Secretary Designate Scandera first. Um, first of all, I think that I think she deserves an up or down vote. Um, however, uh, how one should vote on Secretary Scandera's confirmation is is another is another matter. I've said earlier in in uh, I think in an earlier interview with the Mercury. That um, I, I I'm not sure Hannah Scandera is actually qualified. Um, we you know we used to have a and you remember the days of Leonard DeLeo, right. where we had a, a secretary uh, not a secretary but a superintendent of public instruction, which is a I believe a constitutional office. Yeah. And this requires an educator. This requires someone who's actually had teaching or classroom experience. And I don't think I don't think Scandera meets that that requirement. And I, I, my own characterization of her is is that she's not an educator. She is an implementer. She is a bureaucrat. She is an administrator, and not an educator in the in the full sense of the word. So if I were voting, I would vote against. Um, but I do think she she deserves at this point. She deserves a, an up or down vote. With regard to uh, Sydney Squire, I think you what you see here is a is a is a bargaining chip, if I could be so crude. This is how this is how politics works. I think that you know they're contemplating a vote of no confidence for Sydney Squire, and I think that this becomes then if if Governor Martinez is reelected, um, she would have to be reappointed and reconfirmed, and obviously a vote of no confidence if there was one. Uh, would be would be would work strongly against um, not only the governor in in one little piece of a governor's race, but in reappointing and 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 then reconfirming Sidney Squire down the road. But I think the governor is 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 still interested in, if you will, bigger fish. 
um, if you're looking at immigration, uh, immigration for, for Susanna Martinez was one of the ways that she used the issue to get to get elected, um, i.e., I think, playing on a subtle anti-immigrant sentiment in New Mexico to win votes. And, and she, she did. Um, but still, she's still pushing the repeal of driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants. And she's pushing it this session once again. She feels she has public sentiment on her side. Obviously, there are a number of Democrats who don't agree. Uh, as far as prognosticating on the issue, I don't think another bargaining chip, as far as this particular bill would, the repeal would go. But I don't think I don't think the repeal will make it in this session. I don't think I think that as as in past uh, sessions. I don't think it has the, the democratic support to to be repealed. Um, that's I think that's the most, as, as I see it, the most prominent uh, 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 part of the immigration picture at this point in New Mexico. We don't really have a border security issue here uh, in the in the state yeah. state level sense. But I also know that that Susana Martinez, as she goes around the country campaigning for. Uh, uh, other governors, including Governor Christie, pre pre Bridgegate, that um, she's using this, she's using the immigration issue as a fundraising, as a fundraising tool, yeah, that's and she's gotten some mileage out of it of as we go around. So we know that the um, that the thirty day session is often referred to as the budget session. So could you talk to us about what that actually means? What her budget is likely to be uh, what uh, uh, what a counter budget might be, and if there is one, and uh, how that's organized, and what the politics are on that incredibly complicated issue. I think uh, you know the budget in a thirty day session is the ball game. <clears throat> it is the it is the ball game, and um, budgets, of course, as we've said, we we political science one hundred and one. Budgets are about values and political values and priorities. Um, with this budget, this budget is, of course, no different. We are resource starved, even though apparently we found some, some more revenue during the interim. We found, uh, uh, I think it's, it's uh, maybe a couple hundred, maybe $300 million more than we thought we had mm -hmm. revenue estimates. I'm not sure where the sources of that are, but but um, so Governor Martinez has proposed a six point zero seven billion dollar budget, and that represents a a three uh, percent increase over last year's budget, about one hundred and seventy nine million dollar, one hundred seventy eight, one hundred and seventy nine million dollar increase. The LFC, as we as we know in the budget process, briefly. Uh, in New Mexico, unlike many other states, the, the legislature makes a budget as well. Governor proposes the executive budget. The legislature proposes a legislative budget. In this case, it's, it's the Legislative Finance Committee's budget. They have proposed a $6.15 billion budget, um, up 4.3%, uh, about $253 million more than last year. And... Of course, there'll have to be a there'll have to be a a, a conference committee, and there'll have to be a, a compromise on those. The, the budget this year, the, the figures are quite. The governor and the in the legislature, LFC, are quite fairly close. Um, but the issue always is one of priorities. It's not what to spend. It's never an issue of how much to spend. It's always it's always an issue of how to spend, how to spend, the budget how to spend it, not the level of spending, typically. That will be compromised and worked out. Or there'll be a compromise. Um, but we are, we are, we never have enough money. And typically in budgets in New Mexico, uh, especially in this era of austerity and, and uh, uh, incrementalism, uh, what what is, what will be neglected in the, in the budget will be things like the environment, will be things like social health. The social health of the state will be will be will be neglected. 
uh, it's first things first. And, um, but that's the, that is the issue. And the politics will revolve around how to spend this money as a matter of priorities, not the level of spending. In New Mexico, uh, as we all know, we have to have a balanced budget. There's no, there's no ands, ifs, or, or buts about it. It's a constitutional requirement. And yet, certain politicians uh, seem to take credit for this, as if it were a work, a work of, of miraculous genius. Um, would you address this? Taking credit for balancing a budget in a state that requires it by constitution um, is a little bit of like taking credit for whipping inflation. Um, here we get into a, a, some mysticism and, 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 uh, and political cant and um, um, saving the world and, and uh, accomplishing something that is, frankly, a matter of routine. Uh, budgets, as you, as you pointed out, um, must be balanced by law. And um, um, in some years, I mean, I remember in the middle 80s when the price of a barrel of oil was around $12. And there were serious questions about how to balance the budget. But even in this even in this tough economic time, um, legislate, legislators take politicians take credit for balancing a budget that has become a matter, frankly, a matter of routine. And it's it's again it's like it's like uh, being a kind of an angel with the public. Uh, and it's good politics. Uh, it, it's good. It's very good politics to 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 talk about the great. Uh, feat of doing something that's considered routine, although not always easy. So the question of of taking credit for uh, uh, for being tall or for or for being able to open a door uh, is uh, is obviously a, a political sh a charade. Uh, but there is something that's really not a charade in all of this, and that's the notion of campaign finance reform. We know uh, that there's uh, incredible trickery involved in, in uh, hiding money um, uh, to go to politicians, and this, is, this has become an art form. But in, in New Mexico, is there a legitimate chance for, uh, for campaign finance reform? I mean, will this ever, will we ever be able to have publicly financed elections in our state? The the road to campaign finance reform has been long and arduous and uh, relatively unsuccessful in New Mexico. Um, it has now become a, an even bigger problem with the passage of, or the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United, where you have the ability of independent expenditure committees. Uh, not affiliated with or coordinated with candidates to now spend unlimited amounts of money. And uh, in a state like New Mexico, this is uh, this can be decisive. Um, the goal, the ultimate goal, because it's, it's very much like squeezing a balloon, campaign finance reform. In other words, uh, all of the measures short that you might, one might take short of public financing. Uh, you squeeze one, you squeeze the balloon and a part of the balloon pops out. <laughs> yeah. you, you squeeze again and, and uh, with the passage of some perhaps law rule and another part of the balloon pops out. So the, the, really the only way to, to resolve this, and I mean it's a matter of, now it's a matter of ruining democracy, is to publicly finance campaigns. It's the only way. Now, public financing is, is one of the reforms that I'm going to call for. But uh, it's, a, it's obviously not politically realistic in, in, in New Mexico. However, what's going on in the legislature now and what, what um, I believe uh, Tim Wirth is trying to do is he's trying to clarify, um, cl clarify aspects of one part of the campaign finance law limits the amount of money that that groups and individuals can give to a candidate directly. Okay. On the other side, this is the Citizens United fallout. 
um, independent expenditure committees or super PACs, if you will, um, can spend unlimited amounts of money with very, very minimal reporting requirements and virtually no transparency with regard to who's giving the money. So, um, as I understand it, um, legislator Worth wants more reporting requirements and maybe stricter reporting requirements to maybe get us a little bit closer to some kind of transparency. And um, But there's not much happening in terms of the the overall, there's not much happening in terms of what, what, what's necessary in campaign finance. We've got to have public financing. So I know that the, uh, that you have a, a short but very important list of uh, legislative reforms that you've, that you've been working on proposing for, for, for quite a while. Among them, of course, is uh, public uh, campaign finance reform. But could you describe uh, for us uh, uh, your other proposals as we wrap up this interview today? Well, you know, let's look ahead a little bit and as we wrap up here and, um, and look at what's needed. And what's needed are reforms to the legislative model, the actual structure and, and how the legislature operates. And first of all, once again, I, I think uh, enjoying the luxury of not being a practicing politician or an elected official, I, I could say these things with, with, uh, with full force. Um, we need a full-time professional legislature with full-time professional staffs. If for no other reason than uh, we have to have, the legislature has to have an ability to, uh, to do oversight in an effective way. Short of prof full-time professional leg uh, legislatures, we need longer sessions. Um, we could at least extend the sessions um, three months, six months, perhaps, uh, short of full time, uh, with or without a full time legislature. That reform number one. Reform number two, as we've talked earlier, is is indeed we must have public financing of campaigns. Um, this the, the idea of money in politics is ruining our democracy. If you combine campaign finance as it feeds inequality, it's ruining our it's ruining our democratic system. It's eroding it. It's abscessing our, our, our whole democratic system. Public financing of campaigns, the greatest single policy issue, whether you look at it from the standpoint of saving money or simply as a matter of social health and necessity, the great the great policy issue is is single payer health insurance. That is the great policy issue, nationally as well as in the states. Um, it's probably going to be done state by state. And I'm looking way down the road. New Mexico should become more like Vermont in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sort of single-payer insurance, health insurance issue. But that is the great policy issue of our time. Not only would it save, actually save money, and help the economy, but it would it would it would make inroads in reducing inequality. Uh, but it's a, it's health, it's people's lives, it's fundamental. <clears throat> also, New Mexico needs an independent, independent ethics commission. Now, this has been struggled with, fought over, pushed, tried. Uh, there's been there have been valiant efforts uh, going way back. Uh, for an independent ethics commission legislature. Right now, um, uh, the legislature handles its own ethics. And legislative ethics, uh, you might say, uh, the cynic might say, uh, linguistically is an op oxymoron. But, but no, we need an independent ethics commission. But the question there would be who would appoint it? That's what legislators fear. Always the questions are who decides, who benefits, who pays and who is burdened, and, and legislators legislators are afraid of who would you know, appoint the commission, and that's a legitimate fear. Um, finally, I think that that uh, believe it or not, I, I think a a full time professional legislature with with professional staff, 
an ethics commission, and public financing of campaigns would give us a certain measure of transparency and, and accountability. Those things, which sound, may sound fantasy ridden today, um, but that's what we need. That's what we need. Richard, is always um, times too short. Uh, I'd love to talk about this a whole lot more. Thank you so very much. This has been full of insight, and I've learned a lot as always, and, I, and I'm really grateful to have you here and hope to have you back. Well, thank you, Barrett. It's always an honor to be here with you, and uh, I've enjoyed it, and I want to wish uh, continued great success to the Mercury. So I hope you'll have me back. <laughs>